Cool. Hey, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Arvid. I'm uh, I'm not John. In case you you haven't seen that, we we swap the um, swap the talks. Um, so I'm I'm the CTO of Superscale Networks. That's uh, that's an IoT company um, doing Wi-Fi routers, and I'm also the founder of Corehal. Corehal is an open source project, uh, completely open source. This is why I talk about it here today. Um, it's dedicated to liberating the Internet of Things. So I'm going to introduce two two of our projects today, two of our thingies that can demonstrate, uh, which I just got working last week. So if the demos are broken, bear with me. Uh, yeah, let's get started on that. So. I'll talk about IoT today, and there's probably lots of talks about IoT here, uh, so I just want to get something out of the way, what I mean by IoT, um, so, so we have a common understanding of that. It's, it's, uh, when you talk about unique challenges of IoT, it's important to, to get, the, get the perspective of, of what everyone means about IoT, or whatever everyone thinks of IoT. Uh, it's certainly interesting to get like, um, deployment and this kind of stuff with Kubernetes and all the things that we've seen working on, like small computers, like something like Raspberry Pis. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to talk about edge gateways and constraint devices. These are much, much lower end where you barely can run Linux on it and still not systemd and still not Docker. So th these, are, these are my part of where I'm interested in and where I run companies doing them. I'm just going to grab my water, sorry. So um, if, if you've seen, if you work with these embedded devices, you know that some of these even don't have an MMU, so you can't run Linux on them ever. And this is really what's, what's really interesting for me because there's barely any open source in that direction. Or if we do, do have open source, it's, it's usually constrained to um, being, kind of having a hook from the vendor who offers you that, like something like embed where you're supposed to use their cloud service, which isn't open source. So I'm really interested in, in this spectrum, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, so, so let's do a test in a room. There's not a lot of people here, so let's see how that works out. Um, raise your hands if you know that WPA2, the Wi-Fi encryption, is broken. All right, that's only half the room. I think the other half of the room, especially if I'm looking over there, just didn't raise their hands because they're looking on their phone. So I'm going to assume everyone knows that WPA2 is broken. Um, if you didn't know that, uh, do update your Wi-Fi devices because we now have an encryption problem there. Now, um, let's do something harder. Raise your hands if all of your devices that you have, including your toaster, your Wi-Fi wi light bulb, your router, your phone is updated. Absolutely no one. And that's, that's um, I've, doing, I've been doing this talk for all week, and this is standard. No one updates their stuff. And, and one of the reasons for that is that updates are just terrible. Uh, it's a vendor issue. It's not a user issue. It's it's something that we have in the whole industry. Basically, we have an we have an IoT update problem, and the problem is so large that if you think of 2016 and the Mirai Worm, that thing crashed a million telecom routers and uh, almost took down GitHub. Uh, these runs on IP cameras where you don't get any updates anymore. Uh, so, so we pretty much have a problem there. And I'm not even going to talk about critical infrastructure like nuclear power plants and that kind of stuff. Because there's a saying in Germany, ein Teil dieser Antwort würde die Bevölkerung verunsichern. So we're not going to talk about that. Um, at all systems go, we talk a lot about orchestration. Um, specifically because Linux is very well positioned there. Because Linux is, is like the de facto standard operating system for, for service. And it makes a lot of sense to talk in that context about orchestration. What I believe is one of the possible solutions for an IoT update problem is orchestration all the way which means that not just on servers, but also on edge gateways and down to very constrained devices. This is, this is going to happen anyway. Um, in, in servers, we already don't talk anymore about SSHing into a machine and updating packages. And, and that's a good thing that we're moving away from that. But we also need to move away from that in IoT. Because in IoT, we still do these things if you have SSH. Um, now let me try to explain what, what I, a specific solution, one of the specific things that I do with Corhal. Corhal is a, like a larger project, but specifically what I'm doing with there is, is essentially a solution to like what I've been seeing the last 15 years working with internet connected devices. And if, if you work with embedded devices, like with very low level devices, you know how just how ridiculous things are. Our tool chains are just terrible. Um, if, if, you, if you do web development, if you do web service development, you know that we have fancy stuff like Docker. We have uh, orchestration and deployment tools like Kubernetes, which is really, really good. 
and uh, things like CoreOS popping up. Things are looking good, but in, in Embedded, we're still stuck with uh, printf and uh, you know screwdrivers and stuff like that. It's not that great. Um, now, th th that is all really frustrating, but there's something new coming up that everyone should know about. Um, it's, the, it's the Rust programming language by Mozilla, because they're building a language and an ecosystem that actually works on Embedded. It ports to all of these devices where C is usually the, the main driver right now, but with much better tool sets. So what I do with Corehall is kind of contribute to that ecosystem of, of Rust and try to build our tool chains for IoT in a much smarter and better way. Um, I'm only going to talk about two things because of time constraint. Um, I'm only going to talk about Arkin and Bolter. There's a, there's a couple of other stuff that we do. One of them is a crypto incentivized edge network. I'm not going to talk about that today. So if you came for that, sorry. Um, Arkin and Bolter are, are use cases that are very similar to Docker. This is why I think they're very interesting. Also, they really work like everything else we're doing so far. Um, not in production yet, because I, I do run a company that has 10,000 devices out there but we don't run it in production yet because I just got it working last week. So we're not that crazy. Um, so Arkin is specifically very similar to, to Docker or to something like CA sync. Um, the only difference to, or similar to Docker, but the only difference that with words is Docker is it doesn't use layers. Kind of like, you know, CA sync maybe um, works very similar. It uses a content addressable storage instead of using layers, like what, what, um, what Docker does. But uh, layers are, uh, I mean, content addressable storage are very inefficient for IoT, and I'm going to talk about that in a sec. I'm just going to quickly lose a word on, on what content addressable storage is, just in case you don't know. I, I hope everyone knows by now, because look at CA Sync, it's actually really cool um, for, for cloud services, much better than what Docker does. Um, so let me just quickly explain what, the, what, what a content addressable storage is. Um, as the name implies, it stores and indexes content not by its name, so like a file name or something like that, but by the content of the actual file. So imagine something like Docker, uh, sorry, something like, uh, what's its name? I have it written down here, especially because I keep forgetting it. Sorry, Dropbox. Um, something like Dropbox or a similar service where you upload files and you can share it with other people. Um, or downloaded. Now, let's imagine that we both have like a music collection in Dropbox, like right is mine, left is yours, doesn't matter which one. And we both have a file called heavy mp3. Um, now, what you think is heavy and what I think is heavy might be very different. So those files are not identical, although they have the same name. Why we can both agree that Taylor Swift is kind of cool, so we both store the same mp3. And what Dropbox or similar service can do is they just hash the content of that file. And instead of marking down that I have a file called Taylor Swift MP3, they're marking down that I have a file called this hash. And everyone who has that file uh, gets a reference to the same data, so they only have to store the data once. I mean, hopefully they do it more time for redundancy, but in theory they would only have to store three files here, while there's four files on the slides. This is what content addressable storage does. It's, it's very efficient for, for things like um, when you have multiple system images, multiple operating system images, and they contain sort of the same data almost the same data, which is very common because most GNU Linux operating systems are actually very similar with, with some minor differences and you only want to store the difference, not really the whole thing over and over again. Um, however, ever, ever all of this doesn't really work out so well in, I, in IoT where we don't store file system trees. We also don't even store file names because we don't have the space for that. I mean, these are just a couple of bits, but we need those bits, so we don't do that. Uh, leading me to update safety. Uh, update safety on embedded really means really means this one thing for me at least. It's if you fuck up something, you better be able to unroll it. Um, because if, if you're not able to unroll something on a, on a device that is out there millions of times without user interaction screen, the only user interaction you can do is people will return the device and you will send them a new one. This, this might sound fine for when you have to return a fridge. But if you have a turn or million of a fridge, uh, millions of fridges, you're bankrupt. So if you think of something like uh, the diesel gate, it would have been a lot less costly if Volkswagen would be just like Tesla and they had system updates. But then they would be kind of cool in the first place. So no. Um, one typical thing that people do when, when with embedded systems and update safety is to just store two of the same systems. 
this is this is something that you might not be familiar with if you if you don't know if you haven't worked with with embedded systems is why I'm saying it. Um, what we typically do there is we we store system version one and we mean the whole system version, not just like a specific state of a package tree or something like that, but the whole image um, in one region of of memory, and then we store a second version like the new one we want to have in a, in a different in a different memory region, and if one of them fails, we just boot the other one. Uh, a bootloader is like usually the, this very tiny thing uh, on embedded. It's not like a complex thing like we do on x86 with BIOS and everything. Uh, it's very tiny and usually only does things like if one of the version fails, boot the other one. It doesn't really do much more than that. Unlike with things like Android, for example, they have a fat bootloader. Um, what they do is not fat the file system. It's fat in terms of really big and really complex. What they do is they put the capability of updating your device inside the bootloader. So they're putting the updater in the region that you don't update. It gets really complicated from that point on because Android can update its bootloader, but it kind of, it's kind of a retrofit. It's not really it's not really like a well thought of system. And there's there's also the complexity of the of dealing with um, dealing with that. Plus, you still have user interaction because once your main system fails, you you will not be able to interact with the user in the same way that you would with your with your UI or whatever you have on your device. Um, kind of like on Android, you, you have this fail-safe mode, which people can use, but it's usually used by uh, service engineers, not by, not by actual consumers, because it's still complex. What I'm proposing to do on, on IoTs, actually, it's not that new, um, but if you fit together everything I just said about control and storage, what we can do is we can store both of those systems, but only the parts that are actually different. So what we can, it's, it's more network efficient, obviously, but there, there's one specific key element that's new, which is you can also store three, three system images and do things like A-B testing and these kind of things. Now, why this is, why this is possible is because most of the system image that, uh, most of the system image between versions is actually shared. It's the same code. The only reason we don't, we store it and we don't deduplicate it is because our tools are so terrible on embedded. Um, we do know how to share share application code between two two applications. It's pretty simple. That's what BusyBox does. Uh, if you heard of it, it it just like has multiple executables in one executables, and then the shared part is is shared. Uh, it's pretty easy, but you have to you can't do it like retrofit when you already have something deployed and you want to update just one part of BusyBox, for example. It's not possible. We also know how to do content restful storage. It's it's a fairly common thing. If you want to look at something new, there's IPFS and and systemd CA sync. Ah, that's pretty great. These these are new things in that space, uh, but they don't work for binaries because because the the reason they don't work for binaries really is that binary executable code is is not like a story. It's not like a linear list of things, and if you insert like a piece of code in the middle, then you will just amend the story. That's not how it works. It's more like binary executable code is a list of addresses, and these addresses change. The whole all of the addresses change if you just change a tiny part of it. So doing something like content versus storage with it is, is going to be currently pretty much impossible because it, content versus storage relies on sharing blocks rather than sharing executable streams. And these blocks are going to be different. Every time you link something, every time you just swap two lines from a, from a printf to like printf something else, I'm going to show you in a demo, uh, it changes. This is, this is why we have Bolter. So I talked about Archon before. Archon is basically just like if you're on desktop operating systems, it's not that interesting because we've got CA sync now. Um, it's pretty much the same thing, just for embedded. Um, now I'm going to talk quickly, lose a word on Bolter because Bolter solves the problem of executables being not a linear stream. Instead of linking it the way that GNU-LD does, it, which is uh, GNU-LD links by priority or by by how you, w depending on the order of the input files that you give it, it will it will change its linking output. And what Bolter does, it's it guarantees that two binaries are the same no matter where and who links it at which point in time with which order of input. It will always put the same, let's say, uh, libz printfo in the same region, and it will not touch it. It will not relocate it. So that you can later share those between two different applications. And um, they're also linked in a global space. That means that... Even if even if you have two different application codes, both of them are both of the uh, printf.o are going to be addressable the same way. This is this is very similar to dynamic binaries uh, to dynamic linking. 
The, the only difference really is that dynamic linking doesn't link by content, it links by name. And this has some disadvantages in, in systems where you try to, I mean, if, if, if you did ever, the desktop operating system, you're working desktop operating system, you know DLL hell, it's basically what happens when you link by name and you deploy your application and there's another application on the system but with a, that demands a newer version of the same library as you, so the user might upgrade that library, but then your application is also going to get dynamically linked against that new library, which you never tested. So it might just not work. Um, with Bolter, we avoid that because the, the linking is done by content and the content is still inside the binary. So if two, if two binaries are getting updated and one of them requires a new libc, uh, it's, still, it's just not going to get deduplicated and both of them will get the libc that were originally linked with or the parts that they were originally linked with. And that's, that's important, not the full libc. Just the part that's different between those two ellipses will, will not be deduplicated. All right, demo time. Um, I hope I can make this work. Oh, I forgot to um, change my terminal font size. That's going to look terrible. I'm going to need a second to change that. Very smart of me. Does that work? Yeah. I'm doing it widescreen because I can't look up there. So what I'm going to show you as soon as I get it working, there we go. Can you see this? Can you probably read it? Is the font size big enough? Okay, cool. Um, what I'm going to show you is Bolter with uh, two test binaries. So as I said before, in C, and you all know C, this is just print, this is just print of Hello World. It's not that fancy. Um, but if we change that to something more like, um, we just change a tiny part of it, which is we're just going to print the, the name of the operating system. These, these two files are very, very similar, and you would expect that the, the resulting binary would be similar because they share most of the libc. Like, the, the binary is, is going to be mostly libc if we statically link. Uh, I already did that. Let me just redo it. So now we do what I did there is I linked it. I linked that application uh, statically with libc, with MUSL libc. Um, one time with GNU LD, this is the dash LLD binaries, or with LLD from LLVM, doesn't matter, same thing. And one of them is linked with Bolter. Now you can see that the Bolter line re, uh, binary is already slightly bigger, but I'm going to tell you why that's why that is the case in, in a second. Now, if we have Hello One, I showed you the code for that, and we just store it in a contradictible, damn it, in a contradictible storage. Sorry for that. Badly prepared. Oh no, that I used that before. If we just store it in a contradictible storage, we get, um, like, if the contradictible storage is not prepared for this specific use case, it'll just try to split it into blocks depending on the content. Um, in this case, we've got, oh, I already stored the BLD. I wanted to store, show you the LLD. Okay, that broke in screen. <laughs> Good to know. Okay, so we've, we've seen that it's storing 70 kilobytes, and the plus sign means that it did store these blocks as new. So this is what it's actually going to write to disk. So it's writing 17.43 kilobytes. If we do the other binary, which is um, hello2.ld linked with GNU LD, just getting a different name, um, you can see that's almost storing the identical content. They're both the same size, so both of 17 kilobytes, as you can see up there uh, in the broken progress bar, but it's storing 15 kilobytes. So it can only share like a tiny part of it because all the addresses have changed. Now, if we do, if we store a binary linked with Bolter, um, there we go, we're linking, oh yeah, I already, okay. I did already accidentally store the hello one. So <laughs> here's the demo effect. Um, on hello2, which is the one where it just changed hello world to hello you name, we only have to store five kilobytes. And those five kilobytes are mostly uh, relocations, uh, relocation addresses, and um, the elf header. This is, this is significantly more efficient than anything we've ever done before. It's also significantly more efficient than compression, any compression algorithm, because no compression algorithm will be able to identify the addresses and um, re relocate the addresses in a way that makes them compressible. So this allows us to, to do something that, that, I'm, that I'm really excited about, which is it'll allow us to do safe updates in a very, very efficient way on, on IoT devices. I'm just going to switch back to, yeah, I'm at 20 minutes, great. Um, 
we're not going to talk about that. So I just want to, so after the demo, I just want to lose a quick work on Rust um, because I've written everything in Rust and um, I'm really inspired by it. I, th I think really that everyone should look at it at least, even if you're not going to use it in production. Just because I believe it's the first language since, since C that, or the first popular language since C that really um, tries to get down to, down to the very, very low level and, and tries to compete with C on devices that we currently don't have anything else for. Um, Golang is really not an alternative on on um, on very small devices because uh, Golang doesn't even work without an without a floating point unit, so th that's not an option. But um, Rust really tries to get there, and, and we hope that one day we might actually have an environment with that ecosystem that that's usable and that's as good as what we have in in, in cloud deployment. Um, yeah, that that just means that Archon is currently built for for these embedded devices. Um, we've, we've got things like in, in startups, what we usually do, what we usually see, I, I advise startups, what I usually see is people abuse things like Android for, um, for deployment. So, so they get a device and there's Android on it. It's just some device from China and they try to use that as a system, uh, which is pretty bad, but Arkan will allow them to run a real Linux distribution on that and have a deployment story for it, uh, because it runs there. So yeah, I think I'm not going to talk about the other thing because of time constraints. So I'm pretty much through with that. Um, I will. I will do that. Um, just want to tell you where I'm going with Corhal at the uh, the last slide. So I'm going to I'm trying to I'm trying to break IoT down into engineering problems rather than rather than problems, uh, rather than political problems, because there are political problems. Things like not having updates, um, not having enforced updates for things that are deprecated, this is a political problem. But what I'm really trying to do is break it down engineering problems and solve it from the perspective of, okay, what if we could solve problems like end of life, end of life clouds and problems with up the update crisis that we have, the service disrupt disruption problems we have. I mean, recently um, there was a company that did smart locks and their cloud failed or their update failed or something like that and people got locked out of their home. Things like that are pretty terrible. And I think we can solve it from an engineering perspective if you just make our tools a lot better. Because if we have good tools, people are just automatically going to use them and maybe be less stupid about IoT updates that's really my plan of where I want to get with this. And if you're into embedded devices, if you're into especially distributed embedded devices, and you, you want to solve the IoT update problem, then uh, please stalk me on GitHub, come to me after the talk, talk to me about, about your approach to it and, and how we can proceed with that. Because um, I'm building an open source project. This is, this is not a startup. And I'm really looking for any, any help in that fixing IoT. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, can you microphone? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so two questions. The first one on the storage on the node itself. Um, you're trying to kind of like optimizing instead of having two partitions and switching between them, like splitting in chunks. Um, but it looks like in the worst case, you still need the full space for two partitions. So it's like if you need to update every single chunk because it changed for some reason, um, some, uh, does, it looks like in the worst case, you're still in the same case as I need two partition and exactly double the space for, for storing them. Um, yes, but it's very unlikely because it's very unlikely that you're, you're, you're deploying a system that is completely different from the other one. Yeah, but your system should be still designed with that worst case in mind. So it's like you still need two times the full space. Not necessarily. You know beforehand, before deploying. Right? Before you deploy, you already know how much space you're going to need for that update. So you can just stop the deployment and think about your bad choices in life okay, before you I do see. that. And the other question was related to the linker. Um, how does it play with uh, address space randomization? So like that's a great question. Um, so be because <laughs> that actually came up multiple times during during the talk, um, multiple times I had the talk. Uh, address space randomization. Just in case um, someone doesn't know that, what it does is it loads the executable binary at a random position in memory rather than at a fixed address. The reason for that is that if you find it's a security thing, if if you find a loophole or a buffer overflow in one of the in your code you won't be able to jump at a known address and, and execute code there. So it makes, it makes attacks less reliable. And uh, it does not conflict with, with that. 
Um, the reason for that is that specifically on, on x86, there's a, there's a trick you can use. You can lay out the address space relative. Uh, all of it can be, can be uh, so the, what the linker can do, because it's a static linker, there is no dynamic libraries loaded here. All of the addresses inside the entire binary can be relative. And what we do on non-x86, on platforms that don't have um, PC relative addressing, what we do there, there's a small bootstrap section in the beginning of the executable, which relocates the binary onto, onto the correct address. Uh, how precisely do you mark um, in your linked binaries um, where the cuts shall be placed? Like, um, do you have a header in front, or do you have some special marker that can be recognized? Or how does um, it work? I tried sections. I, tr I tried elf sections, but they're really, really large. So what I do instead is I emit, I emit uh, an elf, an additional elf section, which is a, an extension. Uh, it's an extension type, and that elf section contains a list of um, exact binary positions where you need to split. And then uh, what's the size of your block size? Uh, that's depending on the input. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, I mean, if we can agree on something, how suggested cut marks are marked. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's, it's fairly, um, it's fairly non-intrusive to do this into a binary because it's really just a section with positions in it. it it's not that fancy. Like, it's just probably like 10 lines of code in C to, to read those. Yeah, but well, I mean, I, I'm wondering, like, I've, like you know, see, I think um, uh, we don't actually ever parse um, what we're processing there. Yeah. But it might be nice to be able to take advantage of uh, manually placed markers for for our cuts, and then it would be kind of cool if we could um, teach CA Sync somehow to uh, identify the markers that uh, your linker um, placed there. I think that would be amazing. Um, I'm just thinking of a way to. to um, I think we're going to have to think about that because the the markers are currently written inside the binary, so we'd have to parse it. But maybe there's a way to. Um, well, I mean, one way to do it would be just place some weird identifier in there that is recognizable. Yeah, something then, like at the end of the file or something like that. I mean, just actually add the cuts or something, right? Like as a comment or something, maybe that works. I, I don't know, just an idea. I mean, let's, in, let's think about that. I, th I think that would be a really good idea. If, if I mean, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be reliable, right? Like, I mean, if, if there are some false positives, it doesn't really matter. So. Yeah, I, I can't, um, so what we can't do is um, we can't put content inside the linked section, like specific markers or something like that, because that's executable code. So it would be executed. Well, you could jump over it, right? Like, I mean, uh, that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then you have like the same overhead as elf sections. So I need to be really, really careful and really be space efficient here. But it's but actually I mean, a good idea. Maybe it's more space efficient than elf sections. Yeah, I mean, what I'm thinking here really, really is not just executable. It's about everything, right? Uh, people could, whatever kind of resource they have, also place these markers and give us a hint where a good cut would be. And then uh, your tool and, and my yeah. tool could both take benefit of that. And uh, people just have to make sure that they place these things. Let me think about doing it that way, because I think that's, that's probably the best case for you. It would be great. Everyone asleep? Okay, you can also ask questions after after the talk if you're not. <laughs> we're, uh, we're Lana talks all the whole time. That's okay. <laughs> uh, one more question is: um, uh, Do you do anything else than just make uh, the 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 blocks uh, better placed? Like like for example, the 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 Courgette thing from Google. Have you ever looked into that? They they do binary deltas and they try to deal with um, the offsetting stuff. And to be honest, I find it really horrible because it's so so much bound to. I mean, what, what they ultimately do basically is they disassemble the, they, they try, uh, like, under the assumption that what they're processing there is assembly, uh, like, it's, 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 it's actual machine code, uh, they disassemble everything and then generate the delta on the, on the disassembled um, stuff um, instead of the original stuff. And if it, was, it compresses better or if the delta is smaller, then the binary delta would be, um, they use that. I personally find this this is so <laughs> transcending all the layers of the stack, I don't want to do anything like that in CSync, but... What they found out what was really important was dealing with the offsets and being smarter about them, right? Like, so they basically try to, to uh, take into consideration that um, modifying or, or applying some kind of filter on top of the actual data makes the data um, more alike, and they try to figure out how that, that works. So there's, there's two answers to that. One of them is I still think that uh, ZSCD, um, the, the, the standard compression thing by Facebook, is still more efficient than what they're doing because they're, they're be, uh, because ZSD is able to build 
um, a lot of what's it called a content thingy. Like basically, it know it can learn from that binary a lot better than what you're ever you're trying to do with compressing it based on the the assembly. And the second of the th second thing is I can't do that because this has to be uh, architecture independent. I, I have to guarantee that there's the same compression on on any uh, on any architecture. The third thing is it's actually more efficient already than GNU-LD, although it's not optimized. And the the main reason for that is that we don't have to do dynamic linking, which means that you can you can um, assume that your entire binary is in in the is one linear stream. And linking is a lot more efficient if you can do that because you don't have to do things like PLT, like jump tables and stuff like that, which actually makes it more efficient than, than GNU-LD already. Cool. I guess you're all looking forward to the next talk. So if you have any more questions, come after the talk to me. Cool. Thanks.